Peeps at the Pan American Exposition by Mabel Barnes. Seventh visit, Monday, July 15th, 1901. I went alone to the grounds entering at the East Amherst Gate and proceeded directly to the government building. The northeast corner is occupied by the Department of the Interior, which includes the United States Geological Survey, the General Land Office, the National Parks Division, the Patent Office, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Hawaiian Affairs, the Bureau of Education, and the Territory of Alaska and Census Office. The United States Geological Survey is represented by maps of different sections showing the geological formation and the distribution of minerals and by an educational series of rocks, metals, minerals, sea or stone lilies, corals, mollusks, and fossilized leaves, ferns, and woods. There are also charts of the world's mineral production demonstrating that the United States stands first in the production of coal, iron, copper, lead, and petroleum, second in silver and zinc, and third in gold. The General Land Office has maps and plates showing public lands, their location and character, the timber, mineral, and agricultural resources of various sections of the country. In the Division of Forestry are maps of the forest reserves of the United States. The Division of Hydrography contains maps showing the drainage areas and a model of the drainage basin of the Arkansas River in Colorado. The Division of National Parks is represented by maps of the park reserves and relief maps of the Yosemite Valley, the Yellowstone Park, the Absaroka Range, Mount Shasta, California, and Butte, Montana. Among the places of interest in the Yosemite Valley are Virgin Tears Creek and Falls, Bridal Veil Creek and Falls, Yosemite Creek and Falls, Cathedral Spire, Mirror Lake, Clouds Rest, Washington Column, Sentinel Dome, and Glacier Brook. There are also relief maps of New York City, Massachusetts, and the Hawaiian Islands. In this corner, too, is a large printing press used in the making of maps for the Geological Survey. I secured one of the Niagara River Basin in Grand Island. In the exhibit of the United States Patent Office are displayed working models and machines showing the influence of the patent system in the development of American inventive genius, such as models of the McCormick grain and corn binders from 1831 to 1900, models of the Deering Company harvesting machines, a model of a modern manufacturing plant and of haymaking on an American farm, the original model of Watt's steam engine, Howe's sewing machine, and Bell's telephone. The plows of the nations are arranged in the form of a pyramid with the American plow forming the apex. There are round lap bales of cotton, which are non-inflammable. A voting machine, pictures taken by color photography, mutoscopes, graphophones, a linotype photographing by lines, calligraphs, typewriting by electricity, a machine for making and setting type, a telautograph by which arbitrary signs and characters are electrically transmitted and received, making it possible to send writings, drawings, and figures over long and short lines with accuracy and secrecy, the same being automatically reproduced at the distant receiving station in the handwriting of the sender and an electrograph by which pictures may be sent over ordinary telegraph lines. I secured a picture which was taken from the receiving machine at the Pan American after having been transmitted 800 miles over telegraph resistance. There is shown also paper in various stages of making and pulp and fiber products such as leatheroid and lineoid in the shape of drinking straws, pipes, fishing rods, horns, canoes, trunks, and bathtubs. The mercerizing of cotton is illustrated by diagrams and explained as follows. The fabric passes under tension through tanks containing caustic soda through sulfuric acid solution to stop action of the soda on the fibers and through a water bath to free the fabric from both the soda and the acid. This gives a silky gloss and the strength of the fibers is increased 
When mixed with silk, a greater gloss is obtained. In the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs is a very interesting exhibit, illustrating first the natural talent of the uneducated Indian in pottery, weaving, beadwork, and basketry. Second, the Indian in school, showing classroom papers from the different Indian schools, industrial work in dressmaking, sewing, tailoring, carpentry, harness making, and cabinet work. And third, the work of the educated Indians, showing work as tinsmiths, harness and wagon makers, weavers, shoemakers, workers in ornamental wood and iron, painters on china, and artists. The paintings by a young Indian girl, Angel Decora, are excellent. In the Hawaiian school exhibit, which is in a separate room, are shown some excellent classroom papers, together with samples of sewing, dressmaking, embroidery, weaving, and basketry. Specimens of the flora of the country are mounted on cards. In the Bureau of Education are exhibits of publications on the methods of gathering and distributing information through reports and correspondence, pictures showing work in the Washington, D.C. public schools, in the Annapolis Naval Academy, in the Columbia, Washington Institute for the Deaf, in the University of the State of Missouri, and in the San Juan and Puerto Rico schools. There also occur six daily exhibitions illustrated by means of the Biograph, Stereopticon, and Graphophone, the educational methods in the Washington High and Elementary Schools, the United States Naval Academy, the United States Indian School at Carlisle, PA. On the walls are charts giving the historical development of the American College and pictures illustrating some odd methods of school discipline. The territory of Alaska is represented by exhibits showing the wonderful development of gold mining and the fish, fur, oil, and timber industries, statistics, classroom papers, views of Alaska, photographs of native types, scenes by native artists, articles of dress made of skins, fur, and feathers, implements of the hunt, household utensils, games, and industries, and a life-size wax model of an Eskimo on a sledge. The Census Office has exhibits showing the novel electrical tabulating system with skilled operators at work, illuminated charts, maps, and diagrams showing striking features of national development in such lines as street lighting, fire, police, and school departments, and care of personal property, the progress and movement of population, and the growth of mining, manufacturing, and agricultural interests. At half past 12, I went into the court to eat my lunch, after which I returned to the government building. Next to the Department of the Interior is the Department of Justice. This is represented by judicial records, autographed letters from the files of the department, portraits of the chief justices, associate justices, and the attorneys general from 1789 to the present time, documents showing important periods in the history of the United States, departmental publications, a large number of old law books of great historic interest and value, and a series of blanks showing the routine of business of the Department of Justice, such as blanks used in the office of the attorney in charge of pardons, showing the routine of an application for executive clemency from the time of its inception until it is granted or denied by the president. In this department, too, is the Division of the United States Prisoners, in which are shown photographs and views connected with the United States prisons and prisoners, modes of employment and discipline of prisoners, with souvenirs illustrating the ingenuity of men when in confinement and compelled to rely on their native ability for amusement, such as embroidery, carved shells, and ornaments of various kinds. The Department of Labor makes an exhibit of its work by showing its annual and special reports and its bi-monthly bulletins dealing with subjects connected with labor, especially in its relations to capital, the hours of labor, the earnings of laboring men and women, and the means of promoting their material, social, intellectual, and moral welfare. These facts are illustrated also by means of photographs and color charts. The Bureau of American Republics shows the efficient work of the Bureau in promoting commerce among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. 
Its work has been that of gathering all sorts of information that a businessman must have in order to carry out business successfully with traders in Mexico and the Central and South American republics. The exhibits consist of portraits of the discoverers and conquerors of America, photographic reproductions of the Colombian mural paintings in the University of Notre Dame, Indiana, depicting scenes from the life of Columbus, maps of the American republics, samples of products such as native woods, rubber, wax, shells, nuts, rope, Panama straw, oils, castor oil beans, cacao, sugar, rice, coffee, beans, wheat, maize, guano, rye, palm nuts, cotton, flax, wool, silk cocoons and needles, views in the different republics, portraits of their presidents, including President Diaz and his cabinet, of the ministers to the United States, and old records of the republics, such as copies of their declarations of independence. The Department of State illustrates the workings of the diplomatic and consular bureaus and the Bureau of Statistics, Accounts, Indexes and Archives, Rolls and Library, Commissions and Pardons, Passports and Mail Division. There are shown the various documents relating to the extradition, naturalization, and claims against the United States, treaties, the presentation of the Statue of Liberty by Bartholdi, credentials of consular officials, letters from Napoleon Bonaparte and other kings, queens, and notables, copies of presidential proclamations, and the original draft of the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson with interlineations in the handwriting of John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, together with the old-fashioned desk on which Jefferson wrote it and portraits of all the signers. Many relics of George Washington are displayed, among them a quaint pair of eyeglasses given him by Lafayette and the sword with which Washington wore during the Revolution, the same old blade which he unsheathed when he took command of the army and which he dedicated to the services of his country. Jackson's sword, Franklin's staff, and Captain Isaac Hull's silver urn may also be seen. Another object of interest is a silk flag, woven in one piece and presented to the United States by 25,000 weavers of Lyon, France, as an expression of their sympathy at the time Lincoln was murdered. There are collections of coins and Indian peace medals, on the walls are portraits of all the secretaries of state down to John Hay, oil paintings of President McKinley and Vice President Roosevelt, views of all of the United States consulates and legations, and charts showing the expansion of the United States by treaty. Before leaving the building, I revisited the departments of the Treasury, War, Navy, and Post Office. At five o'clock, I went to the Eskimo village on the Midway. The villagers are representatives of three tribes from Hudson Strait, consisting of eight complete families. I listened first to a lecture that showed the perils of an Arctic voyage, illustrated by stereopticon views of the frozen regions, and then proceeded to explore the village. The natives have brought with them all of their home belongings. There are topeks, or sealskin tents, in which they live during short summers. An igloo, or hut made entirely of whalebone, a great rarity in the north and never before seen in this country. Snow igloos, constructed of plaster to illustrate as nearly as possible the typical winter habitations of Eskimos. Komatiks, sledges made of wood, whalebone, and sealskin thongs with two teams of Eskimo dogs and kayaks, or sealskin canoes, in one of which a native disported himself on the miniature pond. There's also a small seal in a small sized tank. The natives are employed in curing seal skins, carving ivory, and manufacturing clothing. In an imitation ice grotto, some of the typical dances, chants, and athletic games are given. Some of those that I saw were as follows. One, Ongniak, Mulabwit which demonstrates the Eskimos' method of hunting seals upon the ice floes. In this game, one Eskimo simulates the seal while another, armed with his ivory-tipped harpoon, 
crawl stealthily upon him. The seals usually sleep near the margin of the ice pan, from which position at least the least alarm they may take to the water. Their naps endure for only about 30 seconds each, and during their movements of wakefulness, the hunter, always upon the alert, must so exactly imitate their movements as to awaken in them no suspicion of his presence, otherwise he loses his prey. In the representation of the hunt, the hunter, after killing his seal, draws it to the center of the ice pan where he proceeds to skin it in the typical Eskimo manner. Two, Neok, which is a curious method of wrestling in which the wrestlers lie upon their backs with arms tightly interlaced. The wrestling is done entirely with the legs in mid-air, and the more expert or stronger of the two forces his adversary to describe an amusing somersault. 3. Namargok, a game illustrating the method employed by a successful hunter to transport the body of a reindeer. In the game, two men lie upon their backs, each holding the other by the feet. The hunter crawls under their interlaced legs, raises this improvised reindeer upon his back, and carries it to his igloo. 4. Upoitiuk, a combat of toes one of the most ancient of games, which originating with the Eskimos has been adopted by almost all of the primitive races. Five, Umatunuk, a singular tug of war representing seals quarreling over their dinner. Six, Panguliak, the seal race in which the participants simulate seals. They lie flat upon their stomachs with their feet clasped by their hands above their heads. Maintaining this position, they grovel along with floundering slowness, like the seals they imitate. 7. Nanuk Nutongituk, the dance of the white bear. One of their skilled performances is the cracking of a scent from under two inches of dirt at the distance of 20 paces with the single snap of a whiplash. Other incidents of my stay in the village were having my fortune told and my introduction to Iduk, one of the natives. I left the grounds at six o'clock.